Okay, welcome to lecture number 11 in our study of hermeneutics and the application of our rules in hermeneutics uh, to Acts 8, 15 through 17, Acts chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. And uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to look at a different approach to studying a word um, in lecture 10. We studied, we just took uh, an English word that's found in the Bible. And that one uh, specifically being more of a phrase uh, regarding the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, or Spirit, Spirit of God, Spirit of the Lord. And we searched those um, verses of Scripture in our search engine to discover, um, you know, every verse of Scripture that we could find as it really uh, pertained to the activity of the person, the Holy Ghost, in his work of salvation and also in his work of empowerment. Well, today we're going to take a different approach now. Um, we, as I said, you know, we, we did that, we categorized, we grouped, we, we summarized, and ultimately then I paste, um, I posted that on Facebook. And so it, it, maybe your collection of information might be slightly different, uh, but that's okay. The reality of it is, as if we go through these studies and we are objectively looking at all, all of us are looking at the same source of information and we're studying it uh, and with objective, clear rules that then have behind that a, a commitment to, to not uh, confirming our bias, but to understanding what the Word of God says, we're basically going to come up with the same conclusions. I mean, to have a new revelation, there really isn't. You know, the revelation has been given. I mean, the Word of God has been written. And we're all going to come to the same conclusion if we are going after only uh, holding on to those things which the Bible says uh, uh, rather than trying, once again, to support our bias. And so ultimately where this is all going to go is we're going to take all of our study of all the different words and all the different phrases and we're going to converge them into one grouping of uh, and answer our questions about the state of affairs at Samaria after Philip had preached and the people had responded and given their life to Jesus and were baptized in water and then clearly understand, you know, that's their condition um, spiritually. And, you know, finalize in a conclusion then uh, that they were meeting all the requirements and conditions that the scripture describes is essential to be saved and to be born again, to be made a new creature, to be made a new creation. So today we're going to look at salvation, uh, the word saved, but we're going to look at it from a different perspective. We're going to look at it from the perspective of the Greek word, because many times what we'll discover is that a singular Greek word could be translated with many different English words. And so we want to understand all the variety of English words so that when we're looking, for example, at someone was made whole, that we recognize, wait a minute, that was actually the same word that was used for saved or rescued or delivered. And then we're going to expand that even more so that we can really understand this word saved. Um, and we're going to go look at its Hebrews, Hebrew equivalents. And we're going to, in the Old Testament, and how many different Hebrew words, for example, were associated with that single Greek word, um, in this instance, zotso, zoteria, um, either one of those uh, Greek words. And, and, and I know this is taking it up a notch for everybody, but this is important for you to recognize how it is that we can get a full breadth of information out of the scripture concerning any singular topic, okay, and it means in, in, in application of, for example, Zotso or Zotario. And they'll say, ah, see, we're being saved. Well, you're being born again. <laughs> you're being made a new creation. <laughs> you know, you're being you're, you're being made uh, all of these things that we've already described. 
Uh, well, you know, that doesn't make any sense. We're being born again. No, we're born again. We're made a new creation. We're made a new creature. Uh, and then, you know, we'll ultimately say, you know, it's just because someone isolates some particular, um, uh, you know, verb type and in the Greek language, and then all of a sudden they want to make a doctrine around, oh, see, we're not saved, we're being saved. It's a process. And, you know, then they, if they'll begin to apply all the same rules, and then we're being born again. We're not born again. And then when are we going to get born again? And how is it that you're ever going to ultimately group all of these ideas and concepts together in such a way that when you die, you're not still in the process of being born again <laughs> because you haven't arrived yet. And, you know, really a lot of these ideas can quickly be brought into check. You know, if we don't get this myoptic view of the Word of God and just isolate some notion about the Word of God, someone uh, say, oh, well, we're, we're going to be saved in the future. See, the Bible says, you know, you shall be saved or, you know, they're, you know, saved from the wrath to come. And, you know, and I'll give you some examples of that where they're isolating those verses of scripture about the salvation in the future, the salvation that is to come. But they're not recognizing, wait a minute, you're going to be saved in the future because you're saved right now. You're saved from the wrath that is to come because you're saved right now. And then, you know, so ultimately when you begin to take all that the, you know, that the verses of scripture that we're looking at implies, and then you begin to put that together, then you begin to get an entirely different picture. So was Israel being saved from Pharaoh? <laughs> Did they ever get saved? Because you can ultimately then take, you know, these types of words or phrases, and then you lock them down into the context in which they are used. And then out of that, we describe other very important, um, you know, associated words or associated events that more perfectly describe that word, like Passover or, you know, the deliverance from Egypt, this God saving his people out of the land of Egypt from the tyranny of Pharaoh. And then recognizing that it's that association with Christ Jesus, who is our Passover lamb. And then, that that much and then empowered with that much more ability to more perfectly define the meaning of words and not get off on you know some nuance some semantic nuance some you know particular uh, you know verse of scripture that may suggest uh, potentially if you're not looking at it real clearly that salvation is in the future and it's not for now because you, you'll find it in the study, and even just using an English word, just using the word saved, you wouldn't have to, you know, you wouldn't have to go into the Greek words, the Hebrew equivalences, etc., to sort this out. You know, just looking at all of the words and associated words in the New Testament in your search engine, just with save or saves, you know, star or the asterisk, uh, salvation, saved, uh, etc., you would definitely never come up with that conclusion. So then you'd you'd find out. Wait a minute, this person that's up there telling me some you know uh, song and dance about salvation is in the future and it's not now, and that you can just hope to be saved. No one really can know that they're saved. It's just all a bunch of nonsense because you absolutely had the empowerment to recognize what the truth was because you've got the Word of God and now you have a more um, you know it, you know efficient and effective way uh, to study the Word of God because we have all these computer programs. So uh, let me just kind of talk you through a little bit more about what we're going to be doing today. Once again, we're going to focus in on a single Greek word, zozo and zoterio, uh, and, and we're going to ask ourselves concerning zoteria, zozo, and then other words. Um, really, what is the a bigger scope of the meaning as we search this out? And uh, like I said, you know, a single Greek word may be translated by many different English words, and I'm going to show you that. And, well, vice versa, you know, a, it, the reality of it is, is an English word that we would find in the Bible may have actually been translated by, could be translated by different Greek words. Um, I'll show you also here that when you go uh, in into the Septuagint, 
and you look at the Greek word and you look at the context and then you wanted to go and say, well, what was that Greek word translated from? Uh, whether it's a so or it's a teria, but then you would discover that, my goodness, there must be at least a dozen Hebrew words associated with this singular Greek word. And although the word say deliverance, rescue, um, this particular Greek word, soterio, doesn't have too much more depth of meaning, if you would, than what first meets your eye. This same application on other words that are a little bit more archaic or abstract, um, some, some form of uniqueness to that word, when it's being translated by many different Hebrew words or um, maybe even translated by many different Greek words. Um, a single English word translated by many different Greek words. All of a sudden, you begin to get a deeper understanding of that word, and it keeps you from misapplying the word or um, mixing that singular word up with uh, wrong applications or wrong ideas. So this is really important, and of course, it demands a lot of study. And... <laughs> Uh, and everybody, and especially these guys, all you guys that were hopefully impacting your life <laughs> in ministry and the, uh, and the presentation of the Word of God, you're going to do this. As far as I'm concerned, everyone should be doing this. But especially those who are diligently giving themselves to the Word of God, um, you should absolutely be doing things like this. And so what I'm going to show you today is, you know, how we approach this. And like we take Zotso, we, we say, well, we ask ourselves this question, how many times is it found in the New Testament? Well, it's found about 103 times, okay? And um, that would be including, and now I'm not going to get into manuscript type here, um, but let's just look at the major, the 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 view, uh, viewpoint from the majority text, or in this instance, um, the search engine that I used is searching this off of the, the um, USB text or Nestle Allen Greek text. And it's going to be pretty equivalent. So that's why I say about 103 times. And then um, it's found 336 times in the body of the uh, LXX or the Septuagint. Okay, so we got a lot of places to search. That's the bottom line. Okay, we're gonna, you know, if you if you searched everything just in the Greek text, New Testament, in New Testament Greek text, or you and forgive me, you search everything in the Septuagint, then look, you know, you're searching uh, well over uh, what 439 times. Okay, let's just round it off at 440. Probably could even say 450. If you're searching all Greek all Greek text types, okay, um, so um, a lot of places to look. Then when we add to that, then uh, wanting to be able to search everything in the uh, Hebrew language as well, then my goodness, it gets very challenging. You go, my, how am I ever going to work through all of this? And what I'm going to show you is uh, that's the real value of some really great software. Um, for example, if I look at the Greek word in my software and I look at Zotso, for example, then I see here at, that I can actually put this into a, uh, a circular chart or pie chart like uh, type um, application. And then I can, you know, bring out every word that was. Uh, translated save or saved from Zotario, or forgive me, from Zotso in this instance, forgive me, Zotso. And then you can see that in doing so, you know, my first occurrence there is Matthew one twenty one, and she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Then I can go, you know, and I can look at uh, another um, way in which Zotso was translated. I can look at made whole. And then with that, I can look at all of the associate or the Greek words associated with uh, the way that that particular phrase then um, comes to us. And I can see that Matthew 9, 22 is the first time that we see Zotso used in, in this, this way, where it's actually translated 
um, whole and associated with the Greek word uh, that we then translate made, made whole. So, uh, but Jesus turned from uh, turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, daughter, be of good comfort, thy faith has made you whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Once again, another way in which we understand the usage of the word zozo or saved, but it helps us now to more perfectly categorize this word. Okay, and then if I come back, for example, for just a minute um, to that, and oh well, let me just say this. You can see also that there are many other usages, uh, or rather ways in which you translate, um, you can translate this word, zozo, be saved, be whole, healed, be healed, do well, preserve, and we break all of those out. Now, let me go back to another point that I wanted to make under just the majority of the way in which Zotso is uh, translated the majority of the time, which is save. Okay, so when you just search save or, or, and, and, or deliver, uh, then what happens is you know by looking at this chart that you are actually captivating the primary thought um, that is associated with this Greek word or associated with the English word save. And so once again, if you're only capable of searching just the English word, in this instance, you're good. Um, and um, you're going to really understand the, the meaning of that word by context. Remember, I, we're driving context meaning rather than uh, just a denotation or a, a definition out of a lexicon. Although we're going to get, you know, valuable information from a lexicon or a dictionary. But I want to make a point here. When you look at Matthew 121 and you see, and Jesus shall bring, uh, rather, and she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Suddenly you begin to understand something even in addition to uh, uh, the meaning of just the single word zozo. Suddenly we begin to deal with the word Jesus, which was translated. Uh, translated by the Greeks from the Hebrew word uh, Yehoshua, Yehoshua, which is the word for uh, Joshua, the, the Hebrew word for how, how you would pronounce the name Joshua. And we're going to see that out of that comes uh, some very important words for us in the Hebrew language that we'll just, we'll talk a little bit about, like Yash, Yasha and uh, Yasha, um, is a word that Yehoshua is, um, you know, as it were, derived from, if you would. It, that and the uh, abbreviated word for uh, the one that we refer to as Yehovah or Yehovah. Okay, so we, we abbreviate his name Yah, and it's and it's actually abbreviated that way many times in the Old Testament. And so when we take these two words together, Yah and Yasha, then ultimately we can see how the word uh, Joshua or Yehoshua was derived, literally saying Yehoah or as you would say, Jehovah salvation. And so then what that does is it opens up a door for us to even more uh, perfectly then uh, understand other associated words with zozo, okay, or with the word as I as I just mentioned mentioned yasha yasha, which is the Hebrew word for salvation or save, is the primary word in which in the Old Testament in which we will find um, the Greek equivalent zozo being used to, to translate either way. And so just as Zotso primarily is the word used for saved in the New Testament, and it's primarily translated save or deliver or saved or delivered, uh, it's likewise in the Old Testament, Yasha is the primary word that is used and then translated saved, delivered. And we'll go through, you know, some of, uh, some of this and look at hopefully I don't know we're going to have time, the many different ways in which it can be translated, but always looking at the reality then 
as we're as we're going through this of uh, this wonderful event of something being completely uh, transferred from one place to another, uh, delivered or rescued or um, you know as I said uh, going from one state to another state, and so then things that we can use to, to help us along the way are um, lexicons and dictionaries which in many respects will do the same thing for us if we don't have the power of these search engines. Uh, some of my favorites is the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament by Kettle et al. Um, he is going to walk you through every type and every usage of these words, okay? Um, uh, for example, you could take um, in, in, in the uh, uh, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament by Kettle et al., they would take you through how it was used in in uh, in this excuse me in the, in the New Testament. They do the statistics uh, with its Hebrew equivalents. They'd go. They would take you through, um, <clears throat> you know, everything that ha every way in which it was translated in the Septuagint. Uh, they would take you through um, the uh, translations uh, and the way it was used and 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 and, and applied in its equivalents. Right. its relationship to the Septuagint and the Hebrew text. They take you through its relationship to the stems in the Hebrew language, uh, as I was referring to uh, with Yesha. And um, then they will also take you through, you know, all of the different meanings, deliverance, help, salvation uh, through man, uh, the limits of human deliverance. They go through everything. It's an application in Greek, in the Greek language. It's associated words how it was used in later Judea Judaism. Um, they would take you through the Apocrypha, Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, you could actually even look at how it's used in the uh, Ethiopic, uh, the Ethiopic um, uh, Book of Enoch, the Enoch translated, the, what we call the uh, Ethiopic uh, translation of Enoch. Um, and the list goes on. How it was used in, uh, you know, in the pastoral epistles, uh, uh, Catholic epistles, uh, the Johannian epistles, just every possible application. Gnosticism, Greek world, Judaism. Well, my goodness, by the time you get finished studying all that, you should really feel very, very comfortable <laughs> about what the word means. Um, another very uh, good um, lexicon is the Greek English uh, lexicon of the New Testament uh, by Danker uh, et al. We also call it, in short, we abbreviate it BDAG. And BDAG is, I really like the usage of BDAG. It's, it's, it's kind of laborious to get through BDAG, but it's worth it. Um, you know, sometimes, I'm going to say this, sometimes when you go and you look at the usage of the word in the ancient Greek world, in Attic Greek, for example, in prose, um, it, it can be somewhat misleading. And I've got many examples of that. And so, you know, I'm a little bit guarded in its usage. I always benefit from looking at the usage of Greek words outside of the Bible. However, the way that it's used specifically in the Bible, is so important to me. It's first occurrences, how then it's de that word is developed. Because I know that some people are going to really take offense to this, but I just think a word is sanctified in the Bible. It's used, it's used outside of the Bible for various different you know, purposes to communicate ideas. But inside of the Bible, what is it saying inside of the Bible? How is it used inside of the Bible? I think that BDAC does a very good job, which is a Greek English lexicon of the New Testament, of taking us to all the verses of Scripture, uh, taking us by the hand, let me put it this way, to all the verses of Scripture, and now looking at its context definition. How was it used in this verse of Scripture, etc. And once again, you don't need necessarily... Um, Danker at all and BDAG to help you do that, but it's but because you could do it with a search engine. Uh, but however, at the same time, you know there there's a lot of value here. Um, these are men who really set themselves apart by their diligent study and and application to the Word of God to be able to put this dictionary together, a lexicon together. We should make use of it. Okay, 
Then another one that I really like is the Dictionary of Bible Languages uh, with its Semantic Domains by James Swanson. Um, once again, you're going you're going to get a a journey through the Bible and all uh, other sources that would help us to understand the meaning of this word. Some that you may not like, <laughs> like how Aristotle or Socrates or Philo or Plato uh, use this word and, and Homer, whatever, you know, and um, some, you know, uh, cults like the Gnostics and how they utilize the word. You know, we don't want to be associated with these guys, but we understand, you know, it, how how broad of, you know, if you go outside the Bible, how broad of a meaning does this word actually have? Um, so, uh, what, just moving on, I know this is a lot of, it's this is a lot of, some for some people, painful details, and they're like, my goodness, you know, you're scaring me, you know, uh, I, do I have to work this hard, or I'm not this smart, and other things that people will say as excuses. No, 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 we're talking about studying the Bible, you're going to ultimately understand that as you do this, it is not as difficult as it sounds. And that's why I would say this. Just stick with the first application that I gave you uh, yesterday, in yesterday's um, lecture, lecture number 10, of just using the single English word, searching all the verses of Scripture, breaking them out into categories, being sensitive of context, how was that word being used? And, you know, it's really easy with Holy Ghost and Spirit. However, you know, even with that word, you're going to run into places where it's not taught, the, the verse of Scripture is not talking about the Spirit of God. It's talking about the Spirit of man or even an unclean spirit. Well, then you've got to make sure that you're not, you're, you're sensitive to context and you're not going to, you know, take something that is about the Spirit of man and use it to describe the work of the Holy Ghost or something about an unclean spirit and use it to describe the work of the Holy Ghost. And of course, I know the reaction is, well, of course not. Well, of course not, because the context is more obvious to you in that instance. But what if it's a little more subtle? That's why then we want to make sure that we're equipping you with more tools to become sensitive to those subtle context differences and also that much more, if you would, enlightened by the breadth of the usage of a word, that much more sensitive because now you can't just, as I've been saying, find all of the words that you actually want to look at when you're just looking at one English word because so as we're, as I'm going to as I've been showing you and as I will continue to show you is translated by so many different English words and so we want to grab all of the information and let me also say this here's a good thing um, many times when it is being used uh, with a different English word it helps you that much more with categories for example when we talk about Jesus will save them from their sin, we know that that category specifically dealing with salvation, cleansing from sin, the whole benefits of being made a new creation, a new creature, sins and iniquities, God will remember no more. That is beautiful. That's the basis of the new covenant. You know, and you know, when you just take that one word, for example, our, our sins and our iniquities, you remember no more, and you understand that that is really ultimately the whole definition of in and by and large or consequence of this beauty of salvation that you know if you start branching out salvation or being saved then what you see is oh i've got to, you know and i know i'm jumping ahead of myself but it's important oh saved you know not only am i made a new creation am i born again but look at what happened when i was saved uh, my sins and my iniquities were, were removed, they were washed away, they were cleansed, they were forgiven, and they're to be remembered no more. And so you see now, a single word now begins to branch off into various different um, words and phrases so that you more perfectly understand the application and consequence uh, in this particular instance 
of the word save or save. You want to understand it's associating uh, word, associated words with it. What you get right off the bat with Matthew 121. He shall, what does save mean? He will save, what does Jesus mean? It means Yah Yahweh's or Yehovah's or Jehovah's or however you want to say it. I say Yahweh's salvation. It means, in, in which I say, I try to say this to make it more acceptable to everybody, Jehovah's salvation. Or in many instances, people only recognize Jehovah uh, as the Lord, the Lord's salvation. Okay, so, and the Lord's salvation will do what? Save us. Save us from what? Our sins. Well, then sins, then salvation from sin helps to become a number one category for us in terms of understanding the New Testament definition of what it means to be saved. And then when we have that association, then as I was pointing out, we know more you know, perfectly than other associated words. And so now we're going to run down, for example, sin and understand that we're saved and uh, to the to the effect of that our sins and our iniquities are remembered no more. We then understand the application of the blood of Jesus or the, or, or the means by which he did save us. And we can see that then in the, the Passover communion or said, this is my blood that is given to you and for you, this is the new covenant now in my blood, which is for you, uh, for what? The remission of sins. And then we get that word remission. Now, how are we going to run that down? And we're going to see, discover that, oh, that means to erase, to remit, to forgive, to remove. I mean, this is beautiful. Then look at all of the additional associated words that then are implied and are coming together for us that now we can begin once again to search those. And then in the end of that analysis, my goodness, do we ever have a very clear picture of the removal of sins and iniquities through salvation. And then as, as we begin to converge these thoughts together, you know, as I said earlier, um, we begin to see that, yes, just as to be born again, made a new cre creation, made a new creature, made the temple of God, made sons of God, uh, that it, just as those words are categorically associated with the Holy Spirit's work in salvation, those words then are also categorically associated with what does it mean to be saved, to be born again, to be made in a creation. And now we begin to converge these thoughts and these ideas together that we have derived from the scripture by searching phrases and individual words. And what we can do then is we can safely arrive at what the Bible is clearly saying. Okay, someone may say, well, I don't have to go through all that to do this. Well, good for you. But bottom line of it is most of us do. And, uh, you know, yeah. And I think that I, I really push everyone to read the Bible a lot. See, what is your threshold to read through the New Testament? Because when you do, these, these things begin to leap out at you. These realities, these truths of the word of God begin to leap out at you. And you can categorize verses of scripture as you read continually and um you know you can read the new testament 30 days easy you know you can read the old testament and you know what i mean i think that you could read that probably in 60 days easy and you can read the whole of the old and new testament the whole of the bible in you know 90 days can you do that well then if you can you know you're going to benefit a lot but i'm going to tell you right now you're going to also continue to benefit even more by doing these word studies okay doing these phrase studies. Um, so, um, the, so the first occurrence in the Old Testament is um, found in Genesis 12, 12. And the first occurrence in the New Testament is Matthew 1, 21. And, you know, I, I had made mention earlier uh, to the fact that when you're searching in the Old Testament, uh, you're going to come in, and you're going to find out right away that one of the primary words for salvation is Yesha. And one of my favorite uh, uh, dictionaries for the Old Testament is theolo the Theological Workbook of the Old Testament. Um, my goodness, this is, that it is just a great resource. So um, let me see. I'm trying to remember who that um, workbook is by 
but uh, that particular workbook is just it my it is just going to be such it's such a benefit. Oh, who is that? Who is that by? Give me just a minute. Um, it's by um, Harris et al. Okay, Robert Harris et al. Theological workbook of the Old Testament. Um, that's cool. and he's going to break out for you that Yasha Yasha means deliver, uh, give victory, to give help. Um, and to preserve, uh, it could even be to take vengeance, um, you know, which is a, a, a minor way in which it's used from, uh, because now he's going to look at stems and he's going to look at then how you build off of those stems. But primarily as the way we're using it, it's going to be salvation, deliverance. Uh, for the most part, that's how it is going to be translated over and over again. You know, you're going to see application with um, Abraham delivering Lot. Um, you're going to see application with, um, as I said, Genesis 12, 12, which would be referring to um, Abraham uh, being killed and Sarah being saved and um, it, or the potential of being killed and then Sarah being saved. Um, Israel being delivered out of Egypt and, and the list goes on and on. Um, God raising up deliverers uh, that, that we see. Uh, Moshiach, which ultimately is the word from which Messiah was developed uh, in, in the book of Judges, and on and on. So now let me just try to begin to collect our thoughts just a little bit more here. Okay, now, <clears throat> as I said, um, we are we have different categories here that we we could search out. Um, and to, but to make, well, we're, we're not only just talking about our sins and iniquities being removed and how easy it is, or the formula, if you would, or what you've got to do in order to be saved, but also there's the categories, uh, you know, of being delivered from sin or sickness, you know, the, the whole categories uh, that have to do with healing and also being delivered from unclean spirits, evil spirits, the deliverance, uh, aspects of salvation. Um, but what I'm going to do for brevity is I've actually gone through, just as I showed you before um, in last lecture, and looked at all the verses of Scripture associated in the, in the you know, the melu of the different uh, matrices that we've had here of all the different English words that are translated from that Greek word, zozo. And now what I've done is I've gone in and I've grouped them all together categorically sticking only with the word saved, not branching out yet, but sticking where the word saved or, or saved as it has to do with the salvation of the soul. And now I have taken those words and I have, or forgive me, I've taken those verses of scripture and then I've summarized them down as I showed you um, in the last lecture at the very end of that lecture. Now I've done that at this juncture in time for the sake of, you know, being able to get through all of this. And what we have here is that, number one, I have collected saved by response to the Word of God. And so how does salvation come? How am I going to get saved? Well, there's got to be a preacher. And, you know, of course, Hebrews 10, 9 through 14 is, is a, uh, a passage of Scripture that kind of helps bring all of this together. But nonetheless, we'll look at uh, the, the verses of scripture like Luke 8, 12, Acts 11, 14. Um, as I said, Romans 10, 14, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 2, Ephesians 1, 13, 1 Thessalonians 2, 16. Clearly shows us that salvation simply comes by hearing the word and then responding to that word of God. And that then results in a person being saved. The word of God brings a miracle. You know, and similarly to when Peter's just preaching the word to Cornelius, and in many respects, he doesn't even know that Cornelius' house can benefit from all that they understand about salvation, but in obedience to God, he's there, he's preaching the word and declaring to them how that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil <laughs> and get, and boom, you know, that's, they have this wonderful event a response to the miracle of the word of God and salvation is fully witnessed in their lives. 
And so then number two, repentance and remission of sins preached to all nations, and he that believes and is baptized will be saved. So once again, what kind of word uh, are we preaching? What are we declaring? What is the gospel that we're declaring? The gospel that, by the way, Paul said to the Galatians, if anybody says any other, preaches any other gospel than what we've declared unto you, he says, let them be cursed. And everybody ought to really pay attention to that. That's that carries a powerful consequence to go be declaring something other than what God said uh, through his servants uh, uh, like Paul. And so remission, so the word of God is simply that, look, if you if you will believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and God is granting, will grant to you this privilege, this gift of repentance and this gift of remission of sins for your sins, so that your sins may be removed, blotted out. Verses of scripture for that would be uh, Mark 6 to 16 and Luke uh, 24 of 47. Then um, number three, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Boy, is that ever all inclusive. That's a whosoever, not some people, not just an elect few. Um, the whosoever's, you know, because reality of it is, is, is well, I'm not going to get into election right now. I'm going to stick with whoever, whosoever, and just leave it there. There are, once again, I'm not going to try to, at this moment in time, either defame or defend all these various different notions that people have, these bias that people have, where they want to read every verse of scripture through the lens of some doctrinal idea that they have already embraced, whether the word of God supports it or not, or, you know, the word of God has to do more than just support it. It can't just be held up on a stilt, because if I can knock that stilt out from underneath you with clear contradictions from the Bible, then you should be willing to be humble enough before the living God and desirous and hungry enough to get it right, that you'll say, okay, well, wait a minute, let's look at this again. But nonetheless, moving right along, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, Acts 2.21. It's just that simple. You can't write other things into this. Acts 4.12, Acts 16.31, Romans, as I said, Romans 10.9 and Romans 10.13. Um, then the, the fourth uh, grouping that I put together is he that believes shall be saved. And, you know, you can say, well, this is redundant and it could possibly be grouped a little bit um, more perfectly. But I just felt that, you know, in my categorization, I wanted to emphasize this because there's a little, there's a little bit of a, you know, uniqueness here. And so that's why I went ahead and said, Mark 16, 16 again, he that believes shall be saved. It's not only the preaching of, of remission, uh, repentance and remission of sins to all nations, uh, but it's also specifically just that one category of what is the response, not just the, the preaching application, but what is the response of the hearer? If you believe, you should be saved. Now, you can begin to run down things about what does it really mean to believe, but you know, the, you know, Paul makes it really very, very simple in Acts 16, in verse 31, when he says simply, when the jailer says, what must I do to be saved? And the, and he just simply says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in your house and you should be saved. Okay. <laughs> I mean, he makes it instantaneously right there at that moment. You don't have to go through any, you know, um, long process or whatever, or show up at the church. It just call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. We get that in John three sixteen through 17. We get it in uh, John 10, 9. 1 Corinthians one twenty one, And then, you know, one of the uh, categories also, or one of the things that I wanted to emphasize here in salvation was the empowerment to walk with God. And of course, there are, are a number of different verses of scripture that we could list here, but it's really a bit outside of just purely looking at a single word. But Luke chapter one, verse 71 through um, 78, actually, we get, or we could just say 76, we get a a response there from uh, Zechariah as he's prophesying, declaring what now the Savior Christ Jesus is going to do. And he describes now, now we're going to be empowered to walk with God. Now we're going to be able to serve God in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. Once again, broadening out uh, the whole impact of, of, the, of the meaning of salvation. Um, then, you know, real quickly, 
Uh, let me just deal uh, as, as briefly as I possibly can with this notion that um, salvation is something in the future um, and, and look at those verses of Scripture because we do have verses of Scripture that denote that, okay? And uh, so let's see what that actually means because we have to understand it in the in, in, in view of the reality that we are saved. And in, of course, the reality of the majority of what scripture is saying. And also within the, uh, from the perspective that we're not going to create contradictions for ourselves. And so we look at, for example, Matthew 10, 22, Matthew 24, 13, Luke 13, 23, all speaking of enduring tri tribulation. If we continue to go on enduring, if we continue to, if we go through whatever it is that we are confronted with and we remain faithful to God, we will be saved. And so, but that isn't taking away from the reality of what God has done in the simplicity of believing upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the work of salvation that is brought to us by our sins and iniquities being forgiven and the miracle of the new creation becoming ours. And so then we can see then once again that because we are saved, we shall be saved from wrath, okay? Because we're saved, we're justified because Paul's gonna make that an equivalent term or justified means to be made righteous. Once again, now we're getting more understanding than what it what does it truly mean to be saved? Well, what or what is the consequences of salvation? But what are the consequences of calling upon the name of the Lord? This gift of salvation. You get the gift of righteousness. You get the gift of holiness even. So because we are saved or made righteous, we shall be saved from wrath. And that's what, so that is specifically then the application that Paul is using that terminology in, in Romans 5, 9 through 10. And uh, another example would be 1 Corinthians three fifteen, And then also, he uses it in, in reference to um, uh, the resurrection of the body in Romans 8.24. Uh, let, let, me, let me emphasize this because I think it's more than wor worth being um, emphasized. And that is that one of the most important things that are associated with salvation is that we are saved from our sins. That is so important. And this opens up a whole new picture of the meaning of the word because now we are led, uh, you know, to the whole foundation of the new covenant, uh, which is found when Jesus said, this is my blood in the new covenant or the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission or removal, remitting, erasing, erasing. Once again, a great word study, that particular Greek word that is translated remission. Uh, a, a complete removal of the sins, Matthew 26, 28, that this is emphasized as the, the result of the new covenant, which brings to us the blessings of having our sins and our iniquities removed uh, so that they remember no more. There's no process talked about here. There is no ongoing process that, you know, you've got to do this, you've got to go through that, go through the other thing, then you ultimately get it. Wait a minute. Jesus did it once for all at Calvary's cross and made it simple. It happens. It's an event. It's a miracle that takes place. It's not a process of our own works, our own attaining to something. It's simply believing. And, and then as a result of believing, God works a miracle for us. It's something that we could never do for ourselves. <laughs> You know, having our sins and iniquities removed so that we remember that they remember no more. There's nothing that you could ever do to earn that. There's nothing that you could ever do in works of righteousness to erase all the works of unrighteousness. Um, you know, even in the Old Testament, if a man turns from his uh, wickedness and does that which is right, all of the wickedness that he's done uh, won't be remembered, and vice versa. But salvation in the new covenant elevates it to a whole nother dimension of the miracle taking place for us, for us to receive a gift of righteousness, a gift of holiness that is absolutely not, to attain to something and to have something as a gift, as a miracle that we could have never um, gotten to that place otherwise. We could have never 
had the holiness that God gives to us as a gift by a discipline of living. Uh, the same goes with righteousness. The same goes, as I said, with, with our sins and iniquities being removed. The New Testament presents all of these things to us as a gift. And then, you know, when you go in here now and you start trying to break out the comparing of salvation formulas, as you look through all of these verses of scripture, well, you could kind of summarize it like this. This is the way I've, I've summarized it. Number one, Jesus likened salvation into drinking water and described it as a gift that would be received by the asking. Okay, John 4, 14 and John 7, uh, 38 through 39. It's just that simple. There's no process here. It's like drinking a cup of water. It's like taking a sip, okay? It's just a miracle event, receiving what he gives, recognizing that he's the gift, that he's the giver, that he's the giver of the gift. And, and um, that's it. Uh, you can't make it any more simple than that. Salvation is received by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, John 3, 16 highlights that. The example uh, of the... Uh, the salvation formula involves three things, okay? Believing, being baptized in water, and being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Those are three things that are always associated with salvation. Um, then number four, salvation is separated out by believing and being baptized in water. It's separated out from the gift of the Holy Ghost and is separated out specifically here in Acts chapter 8, and then implied elsewhere. And so hopefully those uh, ways in which it was implied, uh, and uh, I have already, I've already described that effectively. We can come back to that later in our final summary and conclusion that we will do probably starting maybe next lecture, but for, no, forgive me, not next, not lecture 12, but lecture 13, uh, as we begin to wrap all of this up and bring all these ideas together. And sorry, I don't have um, a better um, media to be, you know, to present all these uh, ideas and all these things that the scripture is presenting to us in, in more graphic and um, easy to understand formats. The best I can do is take all of my notes post them on Facebook for you, and then be available to answer any questions you might, might have. So um, then we understand that being baptized in the Holy Ghost uh, accompanies salvation. Then number six, the order in which these events happen uh, can be uh, first baptized in the Holy Ghost or what, what was apparent with Cornelius' house and with the disciples there um, in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, then baptized water and uh, baptized in water and then baptized in the Holy Ghost. So you can have, first of all, they get baptized in the Holy Ghost and after that they get baptized in water or you can be baptized in water and then baptized in the Holy Ghost as you see at Samaria. And then the one event that must come first uh, in, in, in either case is that you're believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe, you know, at Cornelius' house, or at, um, you know, Ephesus, that wasn't really powerfully emphasized in those particular examples. However, we know specifically by definition of everything that Paul believed and everything that Jesus taught and everything that Philip was, was ministering that that was indeed the case. So I think I'm all out of time now. Um, I hope that I haven't been too, uh, complicated with this that I presented it simple enough for you to be able to understand and so lecture 12 we're going to begin to wrap wrap everything up with the last two um, parts of this especially focused on baptism and and running down that word uh, and understanding that there's three categories there baptized in the Holy Ghost baptized um, in water and baptized into the body of Christ but I'm going to leave that to the next time and in lecture 13 we'll start bringing all this together lecture 14 we'll finish up and hopefully you will have benefited from all this Lord bless you love you